from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. The fight for yields could be 200,000, 300,000 acres not, not harvested. What may not get harvested this year in Louisiana. Plus, taking advantage of programs to help you flip your soil. We are educating uh, and, and will help to implement in any way that we can. As the deadline for a possible government shutdown draws near. It usually it means that we've got some selling pressure ahead. The impact it could have on commodity markets right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when experience meets expertise. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Lawmakers are running out of time to come to an agreement and avoid a government shutdown. That shutdown could happen this Saturday, which would furlough millions of federal employees, leave the military without pay, disrupt air travel, and cut off other services, including many through USDA. Now on Tuesday, Senate leaders announced a deal on a 45-day stopgap resolution. The 79-page draft bill includes $6.2 billion in aid for Ukraine. House Republicans will likely not pass it. And late on Tuesday, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, along with House Republicans, advanced appropriations bills that experts say have no hope of passing the Senate. Unfortunately, in a, in a tight majority like this, four members can stop anything. So a number of members have been stopping the rule from coming up. Now we are able to get members in a better place and be able to move forward. But the great thing is I never give up. So the deadline's not yet and we're working. We we'll work late into the night. So if your deadline is for a paper to be done in school, but you still get it done on the, on the day, does it still work? Yeah, so we'll do it. And while a shutdown could impact millions of Americans job-wise, it also could be negative for the markets because it creates uncertainty and leaves the market void of important reports. First and foremost, it probably means we don't have an October crop report. Uh, and that's going to be a, a real negative to the grain markets. So all those government reports, the weekly export sales reports, um, you know, even uh, some of the, uh, the meat reports, those grind to a standstill. And typically, when there's a lack of news or, or no news from that standpoint, it's bad news to markets. It usually it means that we've got some selling pressure ahead. You get less supply of treasuries being offered uh, because of the shutdown, uh, similar to what happened when we had the uh, debt cap discussion a few months back. Uh, that could actually lower interest rates short term, although, as Moody's pointed out, uh, these, these financial shenanigans ultimately hurt the credit rating in the United States. Farm Journal Washington analyst Jim Wiesmeyer says Speaker McCarthy's plan is to introduce his own stopgap funding bill later in the week following votes on other appropriations measures related to defense, homeland security, agriculture, and state foreign operations. But he says it's an open question whether House Republicans will be successful in passing any of these measures. Poland and Ukraine are dialing down tensions in their grain dispute. Following a virtual meeting with his Ukrainian counterpart, the Polish Minister of Agriculture said his country's position remains the same, that, quote, Ukrainian grain cannot flow into the Polish market. But he added the talks are going in the right direction to find a solution soon. Również minister Ukrainy mówił o tych niektórych wypowiedziach, które były po stronie ukraińskiej, że to były emocje, niepotrzebne emocje, że my dziś musimy uspokoić sytuację, musimy rozmawiać o, o tak jak powiedziałem, o wybudowaniu pewnych mechanizmów, które będą skutecznymi, skutecznymi dla wywozu zboża z Ukrainy i żeby ono docierało tam, gdzie powinno docierać, gdzie docierało przed, przed wojną, do tych krajów, które docierały przed wojną, a żeby nie zasypywały naszego rynku polskiego. The meeting comes after a series of heated exchanges in recent weeks over a ban on Ukrainian grain, which Poland, Hungary and Slovakia decided to extend to protect local farmers worried about the low price of Ukrainian grain there. It's also reported that during the meeting, the Ukrainian Ag Minister said he would talk to Ukraine's Economy Minister to consider withdrawing a complaint made against Poland at the World Trade Organization regarding this dispute. And an update on a story we first brought you yesterday. Work is underway in Louisiana to prevent saltwater intrusion into the Mississippi River. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers adding 25 feet to an existing 
underwater levee or sill designed to slow a saltwater wedge's progression north, at least temporarily. Now, it's reported nearly every water gauge along a 400 mile stretch of the river is at or below normal thresholds due to drought impacting not just barge traffic, but also drinking water for millions of people. It may be fall, but summer-like temperatures are forecast to return this week. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht has the very latest. Yeah, overall, we're expecting a cooler, colder air to settle in across the United States, but it's not going to happen uh, this weekend or even next week. We look at the temperature forecast for this afternoon, staying away from the triple digit heat in and around Texas. And as we head back up here towards the north, you start to see the surge of some warm air, the 80s and the 70s. Uh, keep in mind, uh, portions of the Midwest, the average high this time of year is right around 70 degrees. So when you see these morning temperatures and these afternoon highs uh, pushing up closer to about 80 degrees, uh, that's easily a good 5 to 10 degrees above average. Check out how far north these 90s go all the way into Nebraska and then more of the 70s into the Dakotas. So one or two days, this is going to be a stretch of some of the warmer, if not hotter conditions sticking around not only tomorrow, but also through the weekend as well. And go ahead and take a look at your screen. Harvest time can also mean great family time. Michael sending this one in out of Nebraska and he says these are the best days and that he waits all day for these moments with his family when they can all ride in the combine. He says they also eat as a family every night. Important memories certainly being made there. We'll talk more about uh, an important forecast coming up in just a bit. The latest on the 2024 presidential election and President Biden has picked up an endorsement from one farm group. The United Farm Workers announcing their endorsement for his reelection. The announcement coming from Biden campaign manager Julie Chavez Rodriguez. Now she is the granddaughter of Farm Worker Union co-founder Cesar Chavez. The union also endorsed Mr. Biden back in 2020. Some Texas grapefruit is heading to Vietnam for the first time. Wonderful Citrus is the largest fresh citrus grower, harvester, packer, and exporter in the western U.S. Now, for many years, the company says it has worked with USDA to grow exports. Earlier this year, USDA was able to get Vietnam to open its market to U.S. grapefruit. The president of Wonderful Citrus says the exports come at a good time in Texas because the industry is making a comeback after a devastating freeze that impacted crops back in 2021. USDA says Wonderful Citrus is just one of many grapefruit exporters that will benefit from Vietnam opening to its product. Now, the U.S. is one of the leading grapefruit producing countries with exports reaching nearly $33 million in 2022. Ag Day is brought to you by ESN. Maximize the performance of your nutrient applications and minimize nitrogen loss by applying ESN. Learn how at smartnitrogen.com. Farmers looking to establish cover crops in their operation this fall or next season can get help through USDA and several industry programs. Ag Day's Michelle Rook has more on how this can help farmers flip their soil to something healthier. South Dakota Soybean is working with the Conservation Technology Information Center to provide technical assistance to South Dakota producers participating in the Farmers for Soil Health program. The program is devoted to increasing the usage of cover crops on corn and soybean acres. We are educating uh, and, and will help to implement in any way that we can, uh, and, and that means mainly information. Um, but we want it to be, cover crops is going to be the huge focus, and how to utilize those, what works, what doesn't, and, and whether it'll work on your farm uh, or not. Those are the types of things we want to get into. Schmidt says cover crops can be tricky to incorporate into a corn soybean rotation, but have long-term benefits. From generation to generation, uh, everybody's trying to do their best to protect the soil, and, and there's not one answer to that. Every, every piece of ground is different, and, and we need to focus on what's important to that family. Uh, they know the ground best. What can we do to assist them in achieving the goals? The program is funded by Climate Smart Commodity Grants from USDA and will help provide payments for new and existing cover crop users. The goal is to sign up 30,000 acres of cover crops in South Dakota during the first three years. Minnesota and Wisconsin Soybean Associations are also partnering with CTIC to promote the program. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. With corn and soybean harvest in full swing, those markets are trying to edge out some gains here at midweek. We'll take a look coming up next.
And later, irrigation water or not, it's been a tough season for soybean farmers down south. We'll visit harvest in Louisiana in the country. The number of communities opposing wind farm projects appears to be growing. That's a conclusion of a study by University of California Santa Barbara researchers finding communities in the northeast part of the country seem to be the most opposed to wind projects seen in red on this map. While it says people in states like Texas, Oklahoma, Iowa, and Minnesota were more on board with them, the gray dots there. They also report wealthy and white communities in the U.S. and Canada are taking the lead in opposition. Analysts believe a higher population density and less space for wind turbines could be to blame. Now that study looked at over 1,400 onshore wind projects in the U.S. and Canada. Corn and soybeans making some gains for a fourth straight session. Agnes Michelle Rook is back to talk it over with Tommy Grisafi of Advanced Trading and Marcus. A mixed day in the markets. I'm Michelle Rook along with Tommy Grisafi with Advanced Trading. And Tommy, that mixed market activity, a lot of that is just money flowing into the quarter going on, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard to believe, Michelle, as we come into the end of Q3, uh, one more quarter to play in this uh, bingo card called 2023 Trading, Marketing, et cetera. It's been, a, it's been a relatively wild year when you look back at where we were versus where we are now. And there's still little things that are popping up uh, that are going to make this volatility continue. Maybe not so much in the corn market. We have a lot of corn. But in other markets, especially outside markets, continued volatility as we end Q3 here at the end of this week. Yeah. Corn and soybeans did manage to end higher, though, for the fourth day, I believe. And so do you think we continue the rally through the reports on Friday? That's going to be kind of key to do that, to establish a harvest low, right? Yeah, that would be huge. Now, I, I did take a drive this week down to uh, central Illinois to Bloomington and back up through uh, the center of Indiana, and I was amazed at what wasn't harvested. So it's rained a lot recently in areas. We have not hit the big gut slot of harvest. It's hard to imagine, but I'd be excited if it happened. It's hard to imagine we'll close Friday real strong on a Friday during harvest, but we can. And if we do, to your point, we'll have several up days and we'll have what we're talking about that bottoming action, that AKA harvest low. But the cash markets, Michelle, the actual where the corn trades, you're not gonna see that pop uh, very much here for as long as that river level is as low as it is. Yeah, basis is really weak and that's for sure. And you know, when we go into the reports on Friday, what would it take, do you think, what would be bullish for the market to push it? And there's all different ways of cranking the numbers around, but, uh, one, the funds are short. I mean, you had talked off the record about how short the funds are. A little spark over there would be interesting. Uh, we could see it in corn. We know coming into it, the numbers in beans are tight. We've had a big down month here, the month of September, and the bean numbers could become tight again. Uh, you also have to look at the world numbers, and the world numbers are becoming very, very bearish. So as we have some tight numbers here or there in uh, beans, when you look at the corn world number, there's a lot of corn in the wheat number. Could be argued either way. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Tommy Gerstaffi, Advanced Trading, and we'll have more Ag Day coming up. Interested in spending a day with a trader? Call Tommy Grisafi at 800-664-4383. Now we look at the temperature outlook, October 2nd through October 6th, and there is quite the contrast depending on what side of the United States you live on. Back here towards the east, in fact, nearly two thirds of the United States, we're expecting above average temperatures, and it's not just a little bit above. Uh, parts of the Midwest, deep on the right side of this legend, and so between the 2nd and the 6th, a good 5 to 10 degrees above average in the Midwest, including Michigan, Indiana, Illinois. Then you come over here towards the west, and there's our trough digging down to the south with below normal temperatures for California all the way up into the uh, the northwest. So again, that's the temperature outlook. And with the precipitation outlook, what we're going to find is between those two extremes. Remember the extreme heat, if you want to call it that, in the Midwest and the cooler and average temperatures out here to the west. Right in between is where we get those storms or those showers continuing to fire up. Not a lot of movement with them as we're going to draw in some Gulf moisture. So that's what paints this green uh, all the way through Oklahoma, Texas, back up into Minnesota. 
with wetter than normal conditions. The brown on the east coast, that is going to be under that ridge of high pressure. We're expecting to set up as we have sinking motion in the atmosphere. Not much in the way of development in showers or thunderstorm activity that extends all the way back up to the north and to the northeast. Good news as uh, leaves are already starting to change colors uh, up there uh, in the northeast. So again, drier than normal conditions. The way this sets up is something that we're going to talk a lot about the next couple of days. Uh, you may hear from uh, national perspective. Omega block setting up in the jet stream, a pattern that struggles to break down. So you get it uh, conditions on one day. They just kind of repeat themselves over and over until uh, we get that jet stream moving again. Here's looking at the jet stream coming up on Saturday. The Omega block, well, it looks like a big Omega right through the United States. A trough of low pressure, cooler than average conditions back out here towards the west. That energy is going to be up and over the jet stream rather than through it you know, with another trough or low pressure off here on the East Coast. Uh, bottom line is we're looking at warm and dry conditions underneath that high. Start off in Pennsylvania, mostly cloudy, high around 67 degrees, low of 58. Washington, North Carolina, don't say little Washington, high around 76, cloudy, low of about 65 degrees. White Plains, New York, mostly sunny, high of 65. Up next, details on an emergency relief program for livestock growers. And later, no rain makes pain for soybean growers in Louisiana. We'll check in on harvest in the country. USCA is announcing two rounds of payments are available under the Emergency Livestock Relief Program. Now, one is for last year's losses. The other is a phase two from 2021. Last year's ELRP losses can stem from drought or wildfires, funds for these programs total just under $495 million. And phase two of the 2021 plan aims to help eligible livestock producers who suffered losses in the value of winter forage. Now those losses would also be due to drought or wildfire during that 2021 normal grazing period. The money for the programs was allocated from the Disaster Relief Supplemental Appropriation Act of 2023, which has a total of $3.74 billion. JBS says construction is underway in Brazil on a cultivated protein research and development center. It will be called the JBS Biotech Innovation Center. It will include labs, a pilot plant, and eventually a commercialized plant. JBS says it has invested $22 million in the project with plans to add another $40 million. JBS claims that the center will be the largest research facility focused on food biotechnology in Brazil. Now, it's expected to open later next year. August was hard on soybeans. Up next, how the heat and a lack of rain made for challenging conditions in Louisiana. We check on harvest in the country. Heat stress and drought have taken their toll on Louisiana's soybean crop. At last report, just 42% of the state's crop was rated good to excellent. And as LSU Ag reporter Craig Gotro tells us, even farmers who had access to irrigation are disappointed in their yields. This soybean field in Beauregard Parish is like many across Louisiana. Plenty of pods on the plants, but nothing inside them. Fields that lacked irrigation have little to no yields, and it seems that even irrigated fields suffered from the heat. We have turned under 400 acres of non-irrigated beans. Uh, there was nothing to them. The irrigated beans, of course, they look better because of water, but still, I think the yields are going to be off. Nearly half of Smith's beans will go unharvested. The three factors determining the success of a farmer's soybean crop are irrigation, planting date, and soil types. What's planted May or later and what's not irrigated, I mean, it could be 200,000, 300,000 acres not, not harvested. This figure could represent nearly 20% of the state's total acreage. Even if a farmer does have beans to harvest, most expect to see much lower yields. If you did irrigate, um, statewide, I'm pretty much hearing from 10% 10, 10 reduction up to 25% reduction. So that's gonna be from the heat stress. For Smith, this was the hottest summer of his farming career and weather he hopes to never encounter again. I don't think I've ever experienced 107 degrees actual temperature in my life, you know, with then plus the heat indexes. So that just took its toll on the, on the crop. While Smith does have crop insurance, he says it will not come close to covering the amount he has invested in his crop. 
With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gocher reporting. All right, thanks, Craig. Now, due to that irrigation, some farmers say this may be one of their most expensive soybean crops ever. And, of course, it comes with disappointing yields. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day. I'm Farm Country.